creationists are obsessed with their mythical flood. The reason, of course, is obvious in that it is in their Bible as having happened. This, of course, presents a problem for them since the evidence suggests no such thing has occurred and so they have to misrepresent what evidence does exist and claim that it represents evidence for their myth when, in fact, it does nothing of the sort. One thing in my travels on YouTube is clear. The more heavily a creationist defends their myth, the less they know about actual science. This is painfully obvious in their attacks on evolution in that they often erroneously, and I suspect deliberately, conflate evolution with plate tectonics, big bang theory, abiogenesis, nebular star formation, general relativity, cell theory, radiometric dating, which is a part of atomic theory. They seem to think that all of these sciences are the same and are a part of evolutionism, and that Darwin was responsible for them all. Despite historical evidence that each of these were initiated by many different people throughout history, and Darwin was only a bit player in the grand scheme of scientific inquiry. In trying to claim that their flood is true, creationists will misrepresent not only evolution, but plate tectonics, geological strata, archaeology, oceanography, and so on. In doing so, they make a number of elementary mistakes that are glaringly obvious to anyone who has taken the trouble to do even a basic level of actual research. Creationists claim that massive amounts of water exist, or at one time existed, on the Earth. They claim that this water existed in one of three main forms. I will not be dealing with the runaway subduction, vapour canopy or hydroplate hypotheses here as they have all been thoroughly eviscerated by the scientific community before. Links to documents discussing each are provided in the sidebar. I will, however, discuss some of the problems that are not widely discussed. The first is the sheer volume of water necessary to flood the Earth to Mount Everest. According to the United States Geological Survey, the amount of water on the Earth is a total of 1.38 billion cubic kilometres. This is broken down as in the following table. So, how much water would we need to flood the Earth? This is a fairly simple calculation to make. Start with the surface area of the Earth. Now, Mount Everest is 8,850 metres above the sea level. According to the Bible, the highest mountain was flooded to a depth of 15 cubits. 15 Egyptian cubits is equivalent to 6.75 metres, so we will need to raise the Earth's oceans to a height of some 8,856.75 metres. So here's the calculation. Running this calculation gives us 4,517,523,502.8 cubic kilometres of additional water. In total, just to remind everyone, there is only 1.386 billion cubic kilometres of water on the Earth. This means you would need to increase the volume of water on the planet by a factor of 3.26 in order to flood Everest. As you can see in the table presented a few moments ago, the volume of water contained in all of the world's aquifers is approximately 2.34 million cubic kilometres, and this makes up 1.7% of the total planetary amount. In order to flood Everest, you would need an additional 193 times the amount of water stored in groundwater sources. Clearly, groundwater sources are insufficient to flood the Earth. This is frankly just a drop in the ocean compared to the overall total. Atmospheric sources, clouds and rainfall, make up approximately 12,900 cubic kilometres, less than 0.001% of the total planetary reserve, and only 0.04% of the fresh water on the planet. In order to flood Everest by precipitation from an atmospheric source, you would need an additional 350,195 times the amount we know is in the atmosphere at any given time. Not only that, but the amount of water needed to flood Everest, if contained within the atmosphere, would have two effects. The first is that it would cause pressure differentials to crush every living organism, and its disappearance would cause every living thing to explode when the pressure was released. That amount of water vapour in the atmosphere would also have the following effect of causing everyone to drown just by breathing. Another source of water is known to the scientific community contained within the mantle rocks on Earth as reported in the scientific journal Nature. Estimates are that, based on the fact that mantle rock material is capable of retaining between 0.1 and 0.2% of its own mass in water form, there is a potential to retain the equivalent amount of water in the Arctic Ocean, approximately 17 million cubic kilometres, or 1.21% of the overall oceanic mass. This report was exaggerated a lot by National Geographic, scientific community's equivalent of a tabloid newspaper. The scientific journals do not report such a figure. It would be like saying that the scientific community was fooled because National Geographic reported a find on Archaeoraptor, or that National Geographic reported cold fusion. Both finds were outright rejected by the scientific community. 
So on the basis of the amount of water needed alone for the flood, we can safely say that in order to flood the earth above Mount Everest, you would need to invoke the following miracles. Miracles are not a scientific method of investigation. By invoking miracles, you are invoking the supernatural and therefore closing down all scientific inquiry. You are invoking magic, and you have therefore admitted that your flood is not scientific. Any pretense at being based on scientific inquiry is thrown immediately out of the water on this basis alone. However, there is more. Creationists will then claim that geologic changes made the flood possible. There are two problems with this. The first is that there is no evidence whatsoever for this at all. The second is that, again, you would need to invoke miracles in order to keep everything and everyone alive on the planet. Allow me to explain. The continents are based on tectonic plate action. Satellites have measured the movement of plates across the Earth. It has been confirmed that all of these tectonic plates, all of them, are moving at the same rate as your fingernails are growing. Now even with this relatively sedate pace, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, subsidence, tidal waves, tsunamis and other geological effects still happen. Mountains continue to rise and land continues to reshape itself at about the same rate that your fingernails grow. One of the problems with the flood, which I won't go into too much detail here, is that the animals would need to be able to reach the ark and some of them cannot swim. This is covered in more detail in other videos. To get around this problem, creationists claim that the land was vastly different to what it is today and that all the land masses were connected. Here's the problem. The geological changes needed to have the land flat enough for the existing amounts of water to flood it and to have the land connected for all of those animals to somehow reach the ark less than 5,000 years ago would cause geological rates to alter as such that the land would be moving at velocities many hundreds of thousands of times faster than this. The geological upheaval to the planet would cause incredibly frequent tsunamis, weather storms, and other manner of planetary catastrophes that would have destroyed not only Noah and his ark, but everything across the entire planet to a point that life would not have recovered. Humanity, and practically every species of life above bacteria, would now be extinct. Again, a miracle would be needed to solve this problem. Now before I finish this video, there is one other problem that creationists deliberately do not address. The Chinese and the Egyptians, among other cultures in existence. You see, the Egyptians were in the middle of building these pyramids. You know, there's funny shaped things in a desert. You know, at the earliest estimate, they were due to start construction within a few hundred years, which presents a problem population-wise, which is another issue. The Chinese, on the other hand, were definitely a functioning civilization at the time, and none of their records for that time period make any any reference to a flood. So apparently both of these cultures were still carrying on business as usual while apparently being buried under 9 kilometers of water for nearly a year. This is an insurmountable problem for creationists whose only recourse is to either call the Egyptians, the Chinese and other cultures a bunch of liars for revising their history, or they have to invoke a series of miracles to do one of two things, erase everybody's memories, or prevent the Chinese and the Egyptians from experiencing the worldwide flood that was apparently taking place around and above them at the time. Now once again, miracles are magic. They are not science. One final point. The fossil record does not support any kind of a global flood. The creationist joke that they call hydrologic sorting is simply not observed. You see, hydrologic sorting sorts by density. The fossils are not sorted by density, are they though, creationists? Nor are they jumbled up haphazardly. They are sorted according to their age in a geologic column. And creationists, while they deny this and how about their flood like wolves in the full moon, they simply cannot explain this scientifically.